Hello everyone, welcome back to Dragonfly Engineering. So this week we've got a new piece of equipment in the shop and we're going to do an uncrating in this episode. And what we have inside this crate here is a plastic shredder or also known as a plastic granulator. And you use a plastic granulator to grind up scrap from injection molding process or plastic injection molding processes. So usually every part or a lot of parts have a sprue which is the runner and the and the gating system to get plastic into your part that you mold, as well as other um, bad parts or initial shot parts that didn't quite fill out. So what you do is you, you grind that plastic up in a granulator down to individual small granules of, of recycled plastic or reground plastic. And then usually you mix that regrind plastic back in with fresh, new, clean, uh, unmelted plastic. And typically you can do like a 10% regrind to fresh plastic uh, to, to have a decent uh, parameter or part uh, qualities at, for, the, for the remolded parts with partially recycled plastic. And I wound up having to get this because there's some supply chain issues uh, with, uh, with some of the plastic I use that I, that I buy from Texas. Uh, there's some, some basically shortages in plastic right now, probably due to pandemic and and other factors similar to like the chip shortage that car manufacturers are having. So I went ahead and got this granulator to recycle some of the plastic that I've got piling up here because I haven't had a granulator before. And I don't really just throw away plastic, so I've got these mounds of, of rejected parts or sprues or other kind of offshoots from injection molding sitting around the shop. So we are going to uncrate this, set it up, and see how it does at grinding plastic to recycle. So let's go ahead and do it. Got shrink wrap. So this is an import. I bought this on eBay, I believe. I think it was twenty-five hundred dollars, and it was available immediately, which is another thing that was of importance. <laughs> but I did get the plastic. Uh, I got another. It's called a Gaylord, so it's fifteen hundred pounds of plastic. So this isn't as big of a deal, but I still have mounds of plastic uh, scrap that I need to get rid of. Okay, so here we go. Looking pretty good. Got a big belt guard. So you got this nice little heart sticker here that says 220 volts. So this is a 220 volt motor. And it looks like, yeah, plastic scrap goes in to this top feeder and there's actually a take-in chute so you can stack plastic in and then there's some basically a, a plastic fling guard which prevents backflow of, of shards of plastic shooting back out of the unit I assume and a whole lot of hinge joints and then down here at the bottom this looks to be the the recovered granular plastic bin and then the uh, the user manual. <laughs> so let's see how how legible this thing is. So, and then this this thing's oh actually got little rollers on it, which is nice. So pretty pretty nice looking. There's cardboard scrap and stuff. So oh oh and then uh, yeah, let me get that GoPro. It looks like there's caster wheels, so this whole thing can roll around on the ground, which is nice. Okay. So we'll do a walk around with this guy. So like I just mentioned, this is where the plastic scrap stacks up in this input hopper. And yeah, quality is so-so, but it's functional. Uh, mostly I like the price. <laughs> uh, it, it all has a layer of dust on it, which I'll have to clean. But then down in there is, is the inlet to the, uh, to the grinder. And then looks like this whole grinder can be pulled open with this clamp here. So let me hinge this thing back. 
And then here's the business end of our grinder. You can kind of see some teeth right there. This is unplugged at the moment and feels pretty sharp. And it looks adjustable. I'll have to probably read the instructions a little and turn this thing on and see what it looks like. But it seems like, yeah, there's a gap here, a shearing gap, but we'll, we'll look at that in more detail. On the side here, looks like a belt guard. And then this is the control cabinet with the emergency stop and then start. Oh, and then down here are the casters, which are cool. A little bit of plastic on them. So I can roll this, this unit around and move it to where, to whichever molding machine I need. I like the little <laughs> tracks that they made. Um, okay, so I think we'll take the belt guard off to see what kind of structure we've got behind the belt guard. Well, that's weird. They... So they got these two hand access knobs, but then you've got to unbolt this one here, so that doesn't make a lot of sense. This is probably for liability. <laughs> and then looking back here, you can see the motor. Oh, there's three V-belts. Uh, probably tensioned pretty well. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so I need to hook power up to this junction box here. Oh, it's in Chinese, can't read that. But, yeah, I have to read their instructions. Oil tank installed inside. Please refill specific oil regularly. Oh, okay, let's take a look at that. Yeah, they didn't clean out their drill filings when they drilled a hole in this in this uh, electronics box. There's still like chunks of steel inside of there, which probably isn't good floating around inside of a breaker box contactor system. So I have to vacuum that out. Okay. Here's a roll around cart that rolls underneath the unit. Yeah, I mean, I definitely got what I paid for. If I were to buy one of these in the United States from a Western manufacturer, it'd probably be maybe eight to $9,000, maybe $10,000. So yeah, it's, uh, it'll do in a pinch, but definitely got some issues. There's some welding wire stick out right there. <laughs> I may have to clean this up a little bit or at least get all the dust off of it. This is like overspray dust from when they manufactured it. So, needs a good cleaning. Let's see what we got going on over here. QC pass, that's good. <laughs> I guess they, they forgot to look at the, uh, the dry paint overspray. Okay. Oh, okay, so this is just a big flywheel. This keeps the momentum going. Oh, okay, and then we can check out the grinders by turning the flywheel. I don't know where the oil goes. Oh, looks like, yeah, I gotta oil that bearing. So I have to, I have to make sure I get the right oil in there. But yeah, this is a cast and turned flywheel. Uh, so that's, that's pretty cool. Oh, that's, this is nice. They have a safety switch, so don't grind my hand off. <laughs> don't want that to happen. Uh, yeah, so let's take a look at, at the grinder itself. So we got these these teeth, which are replaceable, and I'm sure I could remake those myself. And the gap there is maybe half a millimeter or 20 thousandths. And you can see how they've, you can set the gap when you grind down a new edge on your teeth. You can, you can face them off correctly and then tighten them down. I wonder if that's locking somehow. Yeah, I'm not sure. So the one, two, three, four, five, six teeth. Yeah, so there's three, three rows of offset teeth. It's cool how it's offset. I, I assume it's supposed to be that way so that there's not one huge grab and one bite, but it, so this tooth will come down and, and cut its plastic and then 
you know, a, a fraction of a second later, the second tooth will cut its plastic so that you don't stall out the machine, basically, by one huge bite and one, one, one nibble. <laughs> so, again, there's crud everywhere. So it's, yeah, it's a little tricky to, to, yeah, I mean, like, that's, that's machining shavings, like thread. Yeah, those are threads from where they tap the holes, so they didn't clean that out. So the people who actually machined these parts uh, threaded or tapped these holes, but didn't even remove the actual threaded uh, curly cues from the tapping operation. They just drove the bolt in on top of it and kind of broke it off. See, that one is still embedded in the threaded hole with a bolt on it. So that's from uh, gun tapping that threaded hole. <laughs> they just they just left the everything in there, all the machining chips. Obviously, that going into your injection molding machine is 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 not good. So we're definitely I definitely got what I paid for. <laughs> uh, they didn't clean out their thread burrs. But yeah, you can't really yeah, and all of them have it. Yeah, there's, there's going to be so much metal coming out of this contaminating the plastic that I'm going to have to go through with probably a wire brush and clean everything off. And then probably have a magnet sieve uh, where I take all of the scrap plastic that's going to be in this bin and run it through basically a, a, a duct that's full of uh, high-powered magnets to pull all the steel out of the plastic. Um, so we'll see. But anyway, that's, that's the setup. Big old flywheel, big old motor in the back that has a three V-belt pulley drive. And that pulley is another big flywheel, if you can see it in there. Yeah, deep, deep down in there is the, is the pulley drive and flywheel equivalent to the mass of this flywheel. So, the outside looks more pretty than the inside, and we're going to have to... Unfortunately, the more important thing is that the inside uh, doesn't have uh, burrs of metal, big chunks of metal and chips in it, so... <laughs> we'll have to take care of that. Okay, we're over on the back of the machine. This is the motor and the electrical hookup. So I got the impression from eBay, and that's where I bought this setup, that this was a single phase motor, but it sure looks like it's three phase because I see L1, L2, and L3, uh, but no ground or anything, of course. <laughs> so there is a ground screw here. So it seems like it's 220 volt three phase, probably Y configuration, hopefully. Um, so I need to hook up three phase to this thing, Let's see what happens. I guess we can check inside the motor box to see if there's configurations for different voltages, but if it's a three phase motor, it's a three phase motor. Let's unscrew the, let's see what we got to deal with in here. The motor seems pretty nice though. It's, it's got a metal housing and cooling fins. I mean, it's, I can only barely read some of that. I'll take this off. Again, I got the GoPro in my hand. And take this down. What do you think, Sierra? Are you impressed? No, she doesn't seem impressed. <laughs> or she doesn't like cameras. Okay, so here's the inside of our motor box. And these are the three blue wires. This is I'm not even hooked up yet. So three phase 220 comes out of the contactor and probably a circuit breaker through this little tube and into the motor box itself. One thing I noticed right off the bat here is that on the ground tab for the motor, there's no ground wire. So I should probably add a ground wire to this electric motor uh, and then also ground it to the chassis. They've got a little ground screw in this, this sheet metal box which is bolted to the chassis, but I think I'm probably gonna also put a ground lug on, the, on that screw as well to at least ground the motor 
<laughs> so I think that's probably a good idea for safety. Okay, well, as it turns out, the local Home Depot did actually have a three-phase connector, which is cool. So I don't have to, so I don't have to borrow a connector from another three-phase piece of equipment. They actually had it on the weekend. And we got some number 10 four flexible cable here, which we're going to stick this connector on one end. The other end, we're going to plumb into the electrical box. And then we're going to run this ground from the motor to the electrical box and then connect the ground on our 10 four, the green line there to this ground. So the whole system will be grounded, especially the electric motor. And the, the whole point of grounding the motor is that, you know, if, if this motor seizes up and the coils all of a sudden get a huge influx of, of electrical current through its windings, those may, those may heat up enough to burn off the, the insulation on the windings in the motor. And then when those burn off, uh, basically the, the voltage will arc across to the case of the motor, creating the, a hot case, excuse the pun, <laughs> but basically creating a, a 220 volt electric charge on the housing of the motor itself. So if you touch the, anything on the motor, any conductor conducting surface, which is it's a metal motor, or any metal surface or conductor that the motor is attached to electrically, and then another part of your body touches the, the concrete or any other grounded piece of uh, metal, then you're gonna get shocked by a pretty decent amount of jolt. So, uh, and the likelihood that something goes wrong with a motor that's attached to a plastic grinder is pretty high. So and that's, that's the reason why we're gonna stick a ground on here. I don't, maybe the manufacturer assumed that whatever electrician hooks this up knows to pull the cover plate off of the motor and ground the motor. But I would think that a manufacturer of equipment would go ahead and safety ground the components of their instrument itself uh, and not rely on the assumption that the end user would know to look inside of the motor and ground the motor housing to the earth ground of your plug, which ultimately goes back to ground on the, uh, you know, back to the, to the house power. The other thing that grounds are good for is if one of these hot lines breaks free, uh, either because, you know, the, the motor winding shorted or the wire breaks free and then touches the housing. If the housing is grounded, then the circuit breaker, either in this motor control box or uh, for the circuit in the house that you're in, will immediately trip because you've created a dead short. So you're going to exceed the current rating of the circuit breaker, which will open up the circuit or make it safe. So yeah, it's good to ground your motor. <laughs> so we're going to do that. So I got this chunk of wire here, which is a higher gauge than the wire that they're feeding the motor with. Uh, so that, you know, another thing that you don't want to happen is to have your safety ground melt open before it trips the breaker, you know, because that kind of defeats the purpose. Oh, this is a pretty nifty tool. I picked this up recently and it's a wire stripper. So, so there's probably better ways of doing this, but I use a X-Acto knife and I slice along the ground side so that, you know, cause the green ground doesn't necessarily need to have a jacket on it. And I slice enough to split open this, this outer jacket. Usually you can score this stuff and then get it started and it'll kind of split open. There we go. Okay. And then this, this cord's got reinforcing cord in it as well so that you don't stretch your copper if you pull on this thing too hard. I don't know what it's made of, but we can cut it out of there. There you go. 10 snips are real nice for working with this stuff. <laughs> Do it like that. The trick is, how do you, oh, okay, pull the wire out and then let it snap back to its, its base orientation. Okay, here we go. 
for our ground wire, we do have to put this terminal on. So I'm going to shove this guy on, twist it down like so. And then we can use our crimping tool again. So yeah, basically match the yellow dot with the, with the yellow uh, eyelet and then we just crimp down on the wire. And that ratcheting action will set the, the tension just right and make this basically a good crimp every time as opposed to screwing around with needle nose pliers or something. Uh, I don't know who makes this actually. <laughs> yeah, there's no name on it. Anyway, but this thing is really useful if you've got a lot of electrical hookups. You can do a yellow, blue, or red crimp with this, with this guy. So for the power input to this motor box, they had this little rubber diaphragm grommet thing, which, I mean, if I cut a hole through there and then ran our power cord through there, it's not really a good strain relief or, you know, the, the power connection into the unit. So I'm going to not use this. And I went back and bought this, this strain relief. It's a weatherproof strain relief. So we um, basically unscrew the crown nut stick this thing through there and then we screw on with a kind of a standard electrical nut here. In fact, I could probably just do that now. And I'll come back and tighten it with the screwdriver later. And then on this end, there's kind of an adjustable ferrule, this, this plastic ferrule. And then there's, there's like a rubber insert as well, which maybe, no, it's just gripped. So we're going to stick our, our power cord through all of this and string the cap and this ferrule on. I don't know how many times I've forgotten to put this cap on first. It's, we're at the upper limit of this cable, but we should be okay. But I'm going to go to the other side of the box back here. That way where the cable's kind of not jammed up on this door, which swings open as well. So I'm probably going to cut into the cable there. This isn't good practice, you know, because our hot wire coming in is going right by our outlet that's switched, that safety switched. But I'd rather uh, do it this way than run the risk of opening up the power cord through rubbing on this, this side access door. Let's see if I can grab onto these wires. And make it a little harder to pull them out. Let's see. So I just barely have enough wire length here. And it looks like they're using we're going to double up on this, on this electrical connection with kind of a, probably a load contactor or some sort of powered power going to the control box, which they probably just have, yeah, just the <laughs> frayed wire in there, which is what I'm going to do too. I just need to stack them or ideally I'd, maybe I should crimp them together, but I've got them one on top of the other right now. So I'm just going to sandwich them down in this terminal, this, this screw terminal. Okay, we're getting close. So, a ground wire for the electric motor right here. We're gonna string through the conduit. Again, this is all not even plugged in yet, so this is pretty safe to do. All right, so I'll, I'll screw this nut back down onto their little conduit plastic thing. Sometimes you can, 
I don't think this is spiraled. Okay, there we go. I think they just looped the wire too. They didn't even, it's low gauge wire and it's just looped. Yeah, <laughs> oh well. Okay, so we are going to screw in our earth ground to the ground lug of this motor. Okay, well, at least we've grounded our motor. <laughs> So I think we're done in here, so I will screw the lid back on. Okay, so since the screw head is on the outside and it's labeled there, I'm actually gonna run this ground through the grommet from the outside in, because I don't wanna mess around with getting a different thread, because there's a threaded hole here. So, I'm gonna run this outside, pass it through our rubber grommet, and that will also help illustrate in the future if someone's curious if it's grounded or not, that yeah, there's a green wire right there. So, poke that, that guy through, like so. And now we'll, we'll tie three grounds together and onto our chassis. It's getting a little tight in there. Like that. Sometimes wire spring can be tricky. Here we go. All right, so this is what I would say is more properly grounded than no grounds at all. We've got the electric enclosure grounded from the outside to a self-threading screw. We've got the input ground to the power service grounded at the same point. And then we've got a wire from the motor grounded at the, at the same point as well. So three grounds all common right there and then tied into the chassis of the instrument. So. I think that's better than what they had. <laughs> All right, let's uh, stick the connector on and plug this thing in and see what happens. See what it says here. Yeah, oil tank installed inside. Please refill specific oil regularly. So, but I didn't really see an oil tank. Um, all I saw was this this painted over oil spout <laughs> where the lid is or the cap is not on it. Uh, it's either grease or oil. Since they said oil, then I would assume oil goes in there. Well, there's the oil snout on this side. So the, <laughs> yeah, so the belt guard has hand knobs, a hex cap screw, and then over here is a socket head cap screw. So three different fasteners to take this belt guard off. I guess I don't want the belt guard off. But what I'm interested in is that little oil spout right there. So I've got a oiler over here. And we will see if we can get inject some oil into that that thing right there. There I felt it squirting in. Made a little bit of a mess there. Of 
course, the translation of the of the um, manual they may call grease oil. Let me read the manual a little bit more. Well, I may be mistaken by the interpretation of the sign here. It says here, oil tank installed inside. Please refill specific oil regularly. But when I look at the manual under maintenance, they say bearing with seat. Butter should be injected into the oil nozzle of the bearing every 20 days to ensure lubicity between the roller bearings. So I don't have an effective way of injecting butter into the bearings, but I would have to assume that they mean grease, uh, lithium grease. I can't believe it's not butter. I can't believe it's not butter. The taste you love without the cholesterol. What a work of art. Of course, I've already got oil in there. There you go. Okay. We're buttered up. <laughs> so we're looking at the back of the unit right now. I've got the panel off because I'm, there's a 50% chance we've got to flip two, two screws or, or uh, two leads on the uh, contactor for the input breaker. So I'm going to hit the green start button. I'm just going to pulse it to see which direction the motor spins. Oh, the emergency stop was on. Okay, so now I'm gonna pulse it and we'll see which direction our motor spins. All right, it looks like it's, it's spinning backwards. It's spinning the wrong direction. The belt is going that way and our lifting ring on the motor is coming off. So I'll just unscrew that. The motor sounded okay. But let's go and unplug the device and then we'll flip two wires. So with three phase, you, you, uh, you can flip uh, two out of the three wires and that will flip the direction that the motor spins. Uh, I confirmed that the power is off. So I think black and white are probably the easiest. Black doesn't have any of these extra jumper wires on it and white was kind of stacked. So let me pull the black off. And look for any last kind of rub spots or short potentials, any constricted wires. I want everything to kind of just lay naturally without too much stress on the insulation. Okay, and then we will stick our cover on. Okay, this is saying AC3. Oh, I guess it said three phase right there. Okay. Okay. So we'll plug this thing back in. E stop is off. I'll hit the green button. All right. And now we're spinning the right direction. Motor seems stable. You can see how they set the tension of the belts with this, with this bolt that's kind of screwed into this welded tab. But the head of the bolt is almost raised up above the mounting flange of the motor. So that's not the greatest in the world. But it seems to be holding right now. Who knows if there's Loctite? There's Technically, there should be a jam screw on there or, or a jam nut so that it doesn't vibrate loose because this is a high vibration tool. It's going to be grinding plastic. But yeah, that's, that's the other angle setter. And then the motor is mounted with uh, bolts and slots into the base of the, of the unit there. So we can walk around a little. So this is the unit in operation without me putting any plastic in it yet. So let's, I guess it's time to stick some plastic in this thing. I should probably stay out of the fling zone. All right, so I got a bucket here of scrap plastic of various sizes. And 
Here is our collection bin for clean plastic, at least at the beginning with uh, metal flakes all over it. And we've got to slide this under the grinder. I'm going to stay out of the fling zone just in case something lets go. Uh, it'll destroy everything this way, but I'll be over here. And we will turn on our grinder. I believe it's five, a five horsepower motor or four kilowatts, whatever that is uh, in horsepower. Uh, okay, so got safety glasses and hearing protection on and we will start loading the plastic into this intake here. Some of the plastic shooting back out the top. Forget, a, forget the GoPro. I want to make sure I'm not seeing smoke. Well, this seems to be working. I see some of the chips are dropping down below. They're definitely contaminated with dirt, all the grinding oil and everything. I definitely don't want to get my fingers past that safety guard there. So we got a little bit of a thicker piece here. We'll drop that in. See what that sounds like. And then here's probably one of the bigger pieces. Yeah, it seemed to handle it pretty good. Let's try this flat polypro. This is probably one of the biggest pieces here. Yeah. All right. Well, let's make a short work of it. I'm definitely getting good granules down in there. You can see all that. Yeah. So I think I'll do a load. See how much I can just load in. Fast as I can drop it in. see what we got. Sounds like it's still working a little bit. Now I'm going to hit the e-stop button. See, this be the only way to turn off. Yeah, you can still hear that there, there's some chunks of plastic in there. We'll pull out our granules. Yeah, well, that doesn't look bad as far as granule size. It's, it's loaded with contamination, though. It should basically look like a white or a translucent color, but you can see big chunks of metal and stuff in here and paint. Uh, the paint may be an issue for a while. Yeah, that's, I don't know, that's just like grind or weld slag. <laughs> so, but I mean, uh, it is granulating and this I can run back, if no, not this stuff because it's too dirty, but I can run uh, the clean version of this plastic back in through the molding process. So it looks nice. Let me pull the whole thing out. So, not bad for grinding other than the complete mess. There's a few pieces like this one, which, which may have trouble making it through a conveying vacuum hopper, but actually maybe not. So, yeah, so I guess I have mixed reviews. The one concern would be the uh, rampant contamination of metal chips and grinding dust from die grinding and, you know, like weld slag and machining chips still in the grinder. <laughs> but the plus side is that it does grind plastic correctly. Um, let me turn, let me unplug the instrument and then we can see what the inside looked like after running this plastic through it. All right, so. We'll loosen this, flip open. And use the flywheel, which is lower probability of ripping my hand off. Um, and see what we got as far as, if we're able to kind of clean up the area 
with just flinging plastic. It may have cleaned up a little bit. I could still see more thread burrs. <laughs> yeah, just chunks of metal in there. I'm going to have to come in with a wire brush and spend two hours just cleaning all this crap out of here. But, you know, by buying this basically from China on eBay, I, I did save myself about $7,000. So spending a few hours to clean off all the crap that they left behind maybe isn't that big of a deal. You know, looking down in here, for instance, let's see what, how the GoPro's zooming in. You can see like a pile of machining chips. Let me pull that out. And grease and crud. Uh, and weld, weld beads. So, it all needs cleaned. You know, this, th it's shipped this way. I didn't add that. <laughs> and, you know, more, more threads down here. Uh, whoever, whoever is operating the, the tap over there really needs to learn how to clean out the threads. <laughs> so, but, I guess I can't over complain because it is dirt cheap and it does work as soon as it cleans up. All right, well, I think that's going to be a wrap for today's episode. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that I could use this thing and I didn't have to return it to eBay. Uh, but I think I'll keep it even though, yeah, there's, there's a lot that can be improved on it. But I knew that coming into it. So, anyway. Thanks for watching this week, and I will see you guys next week. We're probably going to get back on the Kuka robot drilling the, the robot work table surface. Um, so thanks a lot, and I'll see you later.